The last two Sundays, we've been working through a sermon series based on the four freedoms that we share as Americans. Those four freedoms were outlined by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in January the 6th, 1941, in the standard of the Union Address to the 77th United States Congress. And in that um, statement, he said that there are four freedoms that we have. Because there are the world at that point in time was in an upheaval. America had not entered into the world war, but it, the reality of the threat of war was, was looming. So in the threat of war, he outlined these four freedoms. That is, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. In 1943, those four freedoms were brought back in a very visual way to the public to the American public through a series of paintings that Norman Rockwell had completed that appeared on the Saturday Evening Post covers. They were also picked up by the United States government and used on, on war bond posters to, to provide for the support of the war. So we have been working through, as you, if you've been here, these four freedoms for, and looking at them as Christians in 2000. 12. So we've dealt with freedom of speech last week, freedom in worship, of worship. And today we're talking about freedom from want. So we will be reading from Matthew's gospel. And we're reading in Matthew's gospel in the sixth chapter in verse 25. And there we read. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink, or about your body and what you will wear. Is it not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single day to his life? And why do you worry about the clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow, and they do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today or to, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need. And verse 33 says this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own. This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, this is the painting that Norman Rockwell created to depict freedom from want. And it has become an enduring niche in our memory here in America. And we, we really think of it as Norman Rockwell's Thanksgiving. When, in fact, did not did not appear on the Saturday Evening Post cover in November. It appeared on March the 6th of 1943. Um, on the table, you see a turkey. And that turkey represents the most American of birds. And in fact, I want you to know that when this setting was finished, Norman Rockwell and his wife Mary, they ate that turkey. That did not go to waste <laughs> at all. The lady that is holding the turkey has some blue print dress and white apron. Her name is Mrs. Wheaton. She was actually the Rockwell's cook. If you look in, it would be on your bottom right there, there's a man, you could just see his nose. Remember last week I told you that in all four of the Norman Rockwell paintings, there is the same man, Jim Martin. Well, that's Jim Martin. That's how he made it. He was seated at the table. And across from him, looking at you, as if you are seated at the end of the table, at the foot of the table, looking up the table, is Norman Rockwell himself. On the other side of Jim Martin 
is Mary Rockwell, Norman Rockwell's wife. And there are the Arlington, Vermont neighbors and friends of Norman Rockwell that also appear at the table. And when you think of Thanksgiving, do you think of, or do you think of abundance? A turkey, some celery, a little bit of jelly, and a covered dish, and salt and pepper shakers? Now that was extravagance. You remember this painting was painted in a point in time in which there were, the ration was very much a reality, and there were ration cards and ration stamps. So this picture depicts just enough. Not living in extravagance, not living in overabundance, but living in just enough. The other three Norman Rockwell paintings in this series were all darker in color. But this is a painting that's light. You see the light, sunlight coming through the, the sheer curtains, the whiteness of the tablecloth, the whiteness of the, the iron stone dishes, the Christmas of Mrs. Wheaton's apron. And it reveals hope. And to us, that's an enduring legacy. When I made my, my pilgrimage to the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, the only thing I brought home was that postcard of that picture. And it is on an easel in my dining room, still right now, reminding me that we are freedom from want. So, are you free from want? That's my question for you. There was a person who one day prayed this prayer. They said, so today, God, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been grumpy, and I haven't been nasty. And I haven't been in want, and I really ain't glad of that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of this bed. And from this day on, I'm going to need a lot of help with all of this. I mean, aren't you always wanting something? Don't you? We all need a little, a lot of help with this whole issue of want because we always want something. If I was to ask you the question, and boy, I wish I had this week through email responses or something asked this question and gotten your answer. If I was to ask you this question, how would you complete it in your mind? What do you want? What would you tell me? I'll, okay, I'm going to practice. We're going to say it all at the same time. Okay, I'm going to ask you the question. You tell me. Okay, one, two, three. What do you want? Okay. I really didn't hear anybody say anything other than more of God. Um, but maybe your answers would have been this. A new car. Um, all my bills paid to play a perfect round of golf. Um, an iPad. To sleep all night without having to get up and go to the bathroom. <laughs> Lots of money for my children and grandchildren to be happy. You know, I, our answers are just as different as we are because constantly we want. Our list could go on and on. And I've learned just as well as you have. When I want something and I finally obtain it, I am not ever satisfied. I always want more. I always want more. I found that out when I was in the very first church I was appointed to. And it was just the dream perfect church. In fact, it was two churches. It was a little town church, a little rock church, and a little country church that looked like Norman Rockwell would paint with two outhouses in the back and cows and a cemetery and a pasture. And I got there and it was cold and it was all kinds of things. And after a while, you know what? I didn't want any more. I want the bigger church with air conditioning and real heat, not a stove heat, and indoor plumbing. Um, we always want. And then we get something and we always want more. You know, want to me is like a trash can that you just can't get rid of. I have a trash can that is supplied to me by the city in a, in a huge, larger recycle bin that's provided by the city. But back before they provided the trash cans, I had to provide my own trash cans. I don't know how long I have had a city-owned trash can, but I've tried to get rid of my private-owned trash can ever since then. You can put it out at the street, 
and they don't take it. You can put it out on the collection days that come along once or twice a year when they'll take anything. They don't take trash cans because they think they are containers of your trash that you want to use. One man told me at the last service, if you would just chain it to a tree, someone would come and steal it and it would be gone. So I may try it. So if you'll know where I live if you go buy a house and there's a trash can with a chain on it. And, um, but hopefully it won't be there long. See, we've got to get rid of this whole want thing. We always want. And want is really a first cousin to worry. Want becomes worry. And it becomes a distraction. And it becomes something that we spend a lot of our time on. You know, 40% of the time we worry about things that will never happen or that we want. 30% of our time we are concerned about things that can't be changed rather than just accepting. And to continually have this kind of focus, this outlook on life, affects who we are and who we are in faith as well. Um, when, we're all, when we're always wanting becomes our focus on life, we really miss out on what we have, on what God has supplied, on what we have achieved through God. We miss out on so much. Want causes us, over obsessive, constant want, causes us to lack trust in God. Because God is a God who will provide and who's faithful to us. There is a psalm that you know just as well as you know my name. And it is Psalm 23. And it says in verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The psalmist understood that. Even, even though the psalmist was going through a time of trouble and tribulation and suffering and hardship and a broken heart, he could still say, The Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not be in want. I mean, want causes us to lack trust in God, too. Want causes can have an effect on our relationships with people. Can I have a relationship cause a problem in a, in a marriage? Always wanting. Blaming that you didn't get. Always wanting because that's where your affections are, are focused upon rather than the one that God has given you to be in friendship and in relationship with. Want. It can damage our finances when we spend more than we, we should. It can, have, it can even affect our health. It can cause so many health problems from the stress of want that affects our spiritual life and our physical health, our mental health. It, it does so much. When want. When it is a matter of our focus, we really have to stop and Re, re look at our life and wonder where did we get off focus where is our when our focus is on what we are rather than what we have or what we want we're in trouble and so God desires for us freedom from want that's just not a myth in life and that's just not a statement that Franklin Delano Roosevelt made. But God wants us to have freedom of want. He wants our focus to be upon him and on the sufficiency of his ability to provide what we very well need. Sometimes it does require patience of us. It requires the ability to endure. And you know what? Sometimes we even have to wait. In a society where we just absolutely are frustrated with the whole problem of having to wait. It is a problem nowadays for us rather than a gift. But in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 through 6 we're told this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. 
to trust in the Lord. That is key in this whole warning game. I mean, because we are to trust in what is unseen. Because that's what we have. And you know what? That's what we want as Christians. We want what is unseen. We should want what is unseen so much more than what is seen and what is temporal and what is tangible with money. Because what is seen is temporary. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. That's what Jesus tells us here in the Sermon on the Mount. But what is unseen is eternal. See, he likens this to the lilies of the field and, and how God will clothe them. And he says, see the lilies of the field, how they grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? To trust in the Lord, knowing that he is able. To keep our focus on that which is eternal, not which is temporary. But we live in the affluence of our age. We live... In a world that causes us to want. You cannot pick up a magazine, turn on your computer, watch commercials without some bug hitting you to want. I cannot even read my emails without Joseph A. Banks or Johnston Murphy or Eddie Bauer. And you finish it telling me that they've got a great sale going on and I should come by. And I hate to tell you, I fall into it. Pastor Lee pushed me into it recently. He said, do you know Joseph A. Banks is having a half-price suit sale and you get the second one free? I was in there at five minutes to nine, and you know what? I had two new suits. Um, in technology, oh, the, the world of technology always, does, always causes us in this world today to want the next newest thing, and we make fun of those old things that we thought were so great and hot in that time and now we think they're so obsolete so we must shift our focus and who can do that the only person that can do that is you to shift our focus on the things that are unseen the things of God and so I want to help you this morning as I really help myself. You know that you never preach, a, well maybe you don't because you don't preach a lot of sermons. You have to listen to me or somebody else, but you never preach a sermon that does not come back on you. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's tough. Um, well, that whole freedom of speech thing the other day was really rough. Um, but here, here are, some, here are some steps I want to offer to you and to me to help us in our ability in this battle, this absolute war with want so that we may be free and live the life God wants us because he wants us to be free of always wanting in John's gospel chapter 14 and verse 1 what is the if you know that chapter the first thing that most of us think about is the mansion that we're told about that Jesus has gone to prepare and there's a place for us but verse 1 in that chapter says, Trust in God. Trust also in me. That's what he wants. In order for us to know that which is unseen, we've got to get our eyes off of what is temporary. And automatically we go to, Oh, I'm going to get a big house. He says, Trust. Philippians 4, 6, he tells us, don't be anxious about anything. So here are my four, four um, steps I'm walking through in my own life to find freedom from want. One is to slow down. Just to slow down. And to look at what I have, not at what I have not obtained. Just to look at the blessings that God has provided. Do I have enough? 
What can I share? What can I give away and still have plenty of? Oh, I could give a lot away and still have so much. But when you really stop and you slow down and you look at what you have rather than what you don't have, I promise you, you'll be amazed. In this week, a woman in Sam's helped me with that, a lady I know. And we were talking about our great need for, for rain. And she was talking about her tomatoes in her garden and, and how badly the rain, rain is needed to water gardens and vegetation and livestock and animals. And, and then she ended it by flipping it on the other side. And she said, but you know, I'm so grateful to the Lord for the few tomatoes that we are allowed to have. And boom, she hit me. Slow down. Look at what you do have. Two, live one day at a time. That's all we have. See, we are told here, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Just to look at today. Enjoy the day now. If your eyes are always focused on that which you want in the future, it becomes such a worry and a burden to you that you miss out on what God is revealing to you at this moment. Because he has so much for you and for me and for all of us. Slow down. Live one day at a time. And you know what step three is? Keep a long-term perspective. See, he tells us here, seek the kingdom in verse 33. Verse 33 tells us this. If I can find verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. To seek his kingdom. You are heirs of the kingdom, and, but you are to be revealers of the kingdom here and now. You are, you are recipients of the benefits of his love, but you are to share the benefits of his love now so that there's others that aren't and want also. I mean, we have a God who wants us to be free. And we are free from the want of his love and of his grace and of his sufficiency and of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And of his mercy, and the list could go on of all the freedoms we have because of God. And when we realize that, then our perspective is long term. It's not just temporal and lost in this time. And that really has a way of shaping and changing who we are. It encourages our attitude. Causes us to have a whole different focus that is, has such great benefits for us in so many ways and will also bless and benefit the people around us. And the fourth step is, is this. Earlier I said, you know, God is faithful, and you said all the time. And I said, well, I'm lost in God's faithfulness. That's the fourth step. Is to know that our God is a God who is faithful. And he will meet your needs. To trust in that completely. He will give us what we need. You know, we don't have the mind of God. We cannot really conceive and think and imagine like God. But God has not forsaken one of us. And he is for us. He's never against us, but he's for us. And because of that, we don't have to worry about life or what we will eat or drink or about your body or what you'll wear. Is not life more important than food? The body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single day to your life. 
God in his faithfulness will meet you where you are. So slow down. Live one day at a time. Allow your perspective to be long-term. And remember, God is a God who's faithful. And God is a God that in Him, you and I have freedom from want. Lord, we thank you that in you there is freedom from want. But we battle want in this life. Adam and Eve wanted in the Garden of Eden. Throughout Scripture, we experience people that want it. And Father, we want. But help us to find freedom in all that you provide, in all that you are. Help us to find freedom from want of things that are temporary and are of this world. And help us to find our freedom in that which is unseen. In you and in the benefits of your love. This is our prayer today. And we offer it to you in the saving name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it's in his holy name we pray and say together.